Uh, welcome everybody back to Siegel Talks here at the Martin Siegel Cedar Center, the Graduate Center, CUNY in Manhattan, in New York City that uh, uh, has been hit so hard um, and where the life uh, has changed so, so traumatically, uh, perhaps most uh, traumatically to many, many cities in the US, of course, where it is, but the New York life where five million people take a subway each day, uh, over half a million people go in and out, Penn stations and uh, restaurants, bars, theaters are, are, are part of what makes New York, New York, the contact, the getting together, sharing the variety, diversity of communities, the 250 languages spoken. Everything has come to a halt, as Thomas Oberender um, um, said uh, yesterday. And, um, and uh, we are all in a state of uncertainty. We do not know. Uh, what will happen when things will reopen. I think for another month, everything is closed in New York City. We look outside of our windows. We see the real reality yeah, inside. We are with us in our small spaces. Somehow we are very connected to the world. It's become closer, but our living spaces become closer. We uh, uh, are uh, kind of uh, with ourselves, but not really in solitude because in case we do share our apartments, we are with someone all the time, but we don't have the company we normally have. Um, so it's a confusing time. It's a complicated time. Thomas Oberendel yesterday linked it also to the time of the revolution of the uh, 89 when East Germans went on the streets and fought for the opening. And when he said it was a moment of uncertainty, one didn't know what would happen. Um, um, perhaps it was a bit more uh, uh, hope in those days uh, for the good things that will come. We now here, especially in the US, uh, have fears and uh, will things get worse? Uh, the uh, catastrophe that is uh, the healthcare system, the way how it's been handled by our administration, by a president, where many people say what he advises people to do adds to their death uh, count. We already have it so, so high, um, the epicenter. Slowly other countries are picking up. We hear such terrible News also from Brazil. We had last week Brazilian artists, uh, and they, they had over 1,000 artists um, in uh, 1,000 dead people a day, and it's only growing. So um, it's complicated. We had news from Palermo, which was so encouraging, of a, a city that was able to fight the mafia to survive uh, that that uh, that threat. And they said the way we fought the mafia, we are fighting the virus. But theater arts are part of what we do. They are integral. It's a city of theater. It's a theater of a city. And we heard um, from, um, from them, they're opening, actually thinking about opening, even though they are still uh, in lockdown. South Africa is doing fine, but other places are, um, are in terrible uh, uh, conditions. Um, New York City, uh, of course, uh, reminds of our focus always as the Siegel Center has had uh, quite a close uh, collaboration with artists from the US, but also especially from New York City through our Prelude Festival for over 15, 16 years, we get together New York City artists who, uh, in a curated way, uh, present work in progress. And um, Philip has been with us, Jordana has been with us. And, um, and they are two of the um, workers uh, in the vineyard of the landscape of New York City's theater, important uh, contributors um, whose work uh, uh, goes beyond what they normally do. Of course, they are theater makers, theater artists, performance makers, but they take the idea of organizing community uh, building and activism, a series as Thomas Oberender uh, focused on yesterday from Berlin, uh, from the Feshbu said, you know, perhaps one of the ways we look at the world now is that we have to become uh, acquainted with the idea that perhaps there's not even an artwork, you know, that the work itself that doesn't produce anything, you can't buy it, you can't see, it, but the activist work becomes like Tanya Puguera's great work in Cuba. And in the US, it becomes something of, um, of significance. Thomas Oberender very interestingly said yesterday he is changing his uh, own person who he sings, what he's going to do. He's working on the Bruno Latour show where he says, how can we make a show about environmental threats, but we have air conditioning on. You know, so I say his basic questions, he said, perhaps he has never fully asked. Uh, these are questions we are asking now. Why do we th go do theater and performance? Was it a, what is it good for? and what is changing now. So, and today, uh, Jordana and Philip um, um, are with us. And I apologize for my long uh, opening uh, monologue, but 
um, here we go. And uh, it's a, a message now from, uh, from New York City. And uh, Philip, uh, first of all, thank you uh, for coming. Jordana, also for most of you taking time. Philip, what's going on? Where are you right now? Hi, Frank. Good to hear from you. And thank you for that preamble. I'm in, book, in Brooklyn in Bedford-Stuyvesant. Um, and I wanted to offer, if it's okay, mm -hmm. um, we're going to be together here for the next 55 minutes or so. And I wanted to just ask uh, if we could all together, the, uh, the three of us, and then whoever else might be listening uh, on the other end of this telecommunication, if we could take two of those minutes, two of those 55 minutes to just sit for a moment in silence and to recognize that there are more than 350,000 people across the globe who have lost their lives. Um, many of whom are, um, I'm sure, I, I, who are connected to, to some of us, who are connected to the people who um, we know and love and certainly to this great field, um, the field of performance and theater. And if you can't imagine someone who uh, you're connected to directly, feel free, uh, I, I, I recommend to imagine um, the life of Ahmaud Arbery or the life of Breonna Taylor. We can just, if it's okay with, with sure. us, we'll, we'll, we'll agree to take- here. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So we'll just take the next two minutes and just, Sit yeah, maybe you started and you end it and uh, yes it has begun Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Philip. And for our listeners um, who maybe uh, tuned in uh, just now, Philip did ask us to have two minutes of silence in uh, meditation, memory, or thoughts about 
close to this 400,000 people, and who knows how many there really are. Might be a million um, um, who are affected and died with the virus. So um, thank you, Philip. So Philip, how are you doing? Uh, you know, I'm, um, I'm frustrated. Um, um, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm really, I'm really sad. Uh, I'm not sleeping so well, uh, recently and, um, and I'm aware that that has something to do both with, um, a great deal of uncertainty um, which is ever present in my body as a black person in this country, um, but then also to um, worry for our friends and our neighbors and our colleagues. Um, it is almost a, a kind of unfathomable um, reality we're facing right now. And um, to watch the news and to know that you know, Cyclone has just hit Bangladesh and India, and um, I have friends in West Bengal and um, in parts of South Asia who uh, are dealing with some something, a tragedy on top of a tragedy. Um, and as you mentioned earlier, you know, the public health crisis in this country has, has been a longstanding um, concern um, in part because uh, it affects the people who we're seeing most affected by what's happening right now, which is to say low-income people, which is to say people of color, uh, people who have less access to uh, facilities, to care. Um, and so this is, you're right, we don't know how many people, uh, the actual number of people who are uh, impacted by this um, but um, we know for certain that um, it could have been less. Uh, and uh, that's really heartbreaking for me to even just imagine. Um, so that's where I'm at right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm in a place of, of exhaustion, uh, the kind of exhaustion I've, I've never experienced in my life, I feel. Um, once I had, um, a, a medical trauma and it, it feels to that degree, they feel the same in terms of that was a time where my body was just so physically exhausted because of uh, the trauma it had went through. And I feel the same now, except it, it's coming from an emotional level and it, it feels like everything's off balance and that I'm. I'm someone who's trying so hard to level everything out in a time that I don't think we can level things out. Uh, and I'm struggling to accept that. So I'm definitely in a place where I'm, I'm fighting uh, the impossible. Things that aren't pushing, I'm still pushing against those walls. And it's a daily practice to let that go. But it's definitely one I am steeped in. But then I'm also feeling very grateful for having the privilege to still be in my home for having the ability to connect with my loved ones, um, to have a job security. So I have so many privileges right now that I am grateful for um, that are mixed in and add some guilt uh, that I put on myself, but are mixed into everything that's happening around us in the neighborhood and then on a, like Philip said, on a global scale, there's these moments that I, I remember that beyond all this, these tragedies and these injustices are still happening. They didn't um, press pause or go away th through COVID. They're still happening and they're still the daily reality of so many people. This is just something that's been put on top. And so really trying to sit with that and see just meditate on that and figure out what I what 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 comes up when I bring that in because I definitely I'm in a place where I I have all these emotions and and they're definitely locked here and they've yet to to open and I have no idea what's going to happen when they do so uh, 
I'm waiting for the other shoe to drop in that emotional sense. Yeah. Yeah, even walking through the streets um, of uh, Bedford Stuyvesant of my neighborhood where I live, um, it's uh, typically filled this time of year with uh, great uh, joy and enthusiasm uh, when the sun comes out, you know, music begins blasting on people's car stereos and boom boxes and, you know, kids are out playing uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's quiet. People are wearing their masks. People are properly socially distancing. Uh, people are taking care of each other. I check in on my neighbors um, regularly, uh, but it's a different emotional register in this moment and, um, and acknowledging that that's a thing that's going on uh, and that's a contrast to um, maybe what my body might, might have expected walking, walking down the streets um, any other May 21st um, is, 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 is strange. It's a little bit weird. Um, but I will, but I, but I also recognize that there is this collective emotional kind of compression that's happening. And, um, and I'm hopeful, um, and maybe it is, uh, has something to do with, um, both a desire for um, better things, um, uh, for better days. Um, but I am hopeful that whenever we are on the other side of this, this time that we've spent together, um, uh, this reflection that, that so many of us have been doing is really moves, moves us towards um, uh, something something of great impact. Um, so I, I'm incredibly, incredibly hopeful, but also uh, it's impossible to, to um, sometimes it feels a little bit impossible <laughs> to, um, uh, to just, you know, sometimes even smile. <laughs> um, but it's good to see the both of you. Um, you as well. That helps. <laughs> Yeah, and even when you you talk about getting to the the other side of this, um, something I've been thinking a lot about is, which I'm sure we all have, but what, what does that mean? Um, more so, not what's going to happen there, what's what is going to what we'll find there, but is there another side, or does this, you know, is if this is as long term as we are thinking, or even for instance, today I was talking to um, some artistic directors and one was saying that they weren't even going to ask staff back until there was a vaccine. Mm. And so say something like that is a year and a half away. Uh, it's not the, then the other side is years away. So I'm trying to start thinking about it in somewhere that there's not a destination, but just mm. what, our, what our journey is because I know every time that I've set a destination, every time that I've gotten um, emotionally connected to a date that has been given to us where we will be encouraged to stop quarantine, which you know in March, those felt very real. And then April, they felt really re real to me. And then May, I, I stopped, uh, you know, May 15th was supposed to be one. And I, I accepted May 1st that that is not going to happen. At least I'm speaking from, you know, Brooklyn and New York. But I, I think I'm starting to try to come to terms with and chew on what does it look like if I personally don't think of it as one side I'm on and then the other side. And the other side, it sounds beautiful, but what if it's not like that, if that makes sense? But I think something, Philip, you said about hope, I think that that's the thing that translates from one side to the next or from no matter if it's that version or if it's a journey or if it's like the ocean and all these different waves, because that's what to me it feels like, rather than one side or the next, it's gonna be just different waves that some are gonna be huge and some are gonna be gentle and some are going to crash violently um, and some are going to be soothing. But something that, something I had said to you when we spoke earlier this week is a place I was, was 
I couldn't see everything was just felt like it was in darkness. Um, that's where I felt like I was a few weeks ago. And now I'm at a point that I can see a tunnel and I cannot see the light at the end of the tunnel. I haven't reached that point yet, but it's, it's very, for me, like the hope comes in that a few weeks ago, there was no tunnel. I couldn't imagine the tunnel. And now I, I can see it and envision it and I can get to a place where I, I'm trying to touch it. And I just, I hope that um, light will appear at some point. Mm. I have great, um, I, I, that makes me, that, like that makes me feel like some, some sense, sense of delight. <laughs> um, and I, receive some of that <laughs> um, that you just shared, Jordana, because um, there is a lot, and Frank mentioned it um, earlier, you know, um, there is a lot of trivialization happening around the present moment um, at the highest levels um, of the government um, uh, and certainly um, some industries um, you mentioned um, in, engaging with other artistic directors and someone expressing that they're not going to uh, invite their staff back until there's a vaccine, that actually also gives me some great hope because someone's making a decision based on their values and based on their principles. And probably that's how they have been making decisions, I, I would hope or I imagine, mm -hmm. um, for a while. You know, I think of the work that you do at Jack the work that has been ongoing there for so many years as being so as being incredibly uh, liberative, but also an expression of um, the values of the people who uh, are a part of the community of makers um, that 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 work at Jack, um, and that gives me actually that also gives me great hope. It gives me a little bit of pride too, like Brooklyn pride, or I don't know, something like black pride, you know, plus, oh, plus, definitely. <laughs> you know, but it's like, this is the, 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 the reality we are uh, living in is or whatever comes on the other side of the tunnel is going to be shaped by how we determine our, our pathway through it. Um, yes. And, and not by, um, hopefully not by market forces, hopefully not by um, the ways in which uh, we did things previously. We hear, you know, the American president uh, saying yesterday, we need to get back to normalization. And you're like, normalization for me is, you know, threats of endangerment, you know, um, and, um, uh, and fear. And um, in some, some scenarios, a sense of scarcity uh, and I'm not moving in that direction. Uh, you know, I refuse um, to return to, um, to the way things were, to the status quo. Um, so uh, I'm encouraged by, um, by both what you've just shared with us and also by the work that you do. Um, and so thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I mean, Jack is the great uh, artsmith center in Brooklyn. Alec Duffy, uh, against all odds, uh, was able to create a space that, you know, makes New York, New York. And Jordana has been part of it as well as in the Armory, which is interesting. Normally, then one doesn't really travel between such organizations. But do you guys feel your, your community is hit harder by COVID? Or do you feel New York artists, uh, performance theater artists, share, they sit in the same boat? That's tricky. Um, Philip, jump in at any time, but I feel, I truly feel that I often, to be honest, live in, in a vacuum. And that's something that I, as my life goes on month to month, year to year, I try to break out of. But I do feel like I am most connected with theater artists of all different types from curators, producers, directors, actors, designers, and those are the voices that I'm mainly hearing on a daily basis. So I'm hearing their struggles. I'm hearing their losses um, that they're, they're fighting 
they're they're battling forward and so I feel like I don't I don't have much many other groups of people that I'm connected with who are in different places I feel like I I have that perspective and I'm in that and then that of being a um, black queer woman you know there's there's that space and there's that that I hold in me and through me and is me and so to see what's happening within the black and brown and queer community on a larger scale uh which just feels like a just a, a constant injustice that we are once again being faced with and is being brought to the, the face of the news and put in everyone's ear, yet there is no change. That's not new for us. It's not new for us to, to have terrible things happen and not see a change or response. And so that's all just to say that I feel like I'm in this one nook of just the arts and then this larger nook of my overall completely lived identity and that's who I'm hearing from. And in that world, I do feel like my identity of a queer woman as a black woman, uh, that I feel like is being struck harder than our art community. Yeah, I mean, I, I am, um, uh, I'm with you. Um, you know, there's, uh, you know, to just jump off of, you know, what Jordana has shared, you know, it's it does feel a lot like vertigo in some ways, and it's important, I think, also too, for, you know, for um, whoever is you know out there listening that you know it, 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 it here in New York City, which is as Frank mentioned, the epicenter of the epidemic uh, in the United States. Um, there have been, I think, something around fifteen thousand people who have uh, perished and. Uh, uh, recent reports coming out from the health uh, department um, are uh, are bleak, and um, particularly as it relates to the various communities that Jordana mentioned, which are our intersectional communities. Um, uh, reports uh, from the CDC and from the health department uh, are saying that uh, 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 black people are twice or three times as likely to uh, become infected or to die from COVID-19. Um, uh, uh, Latinx community members are um, two times as likely. Um, the hardest hit neighborhoods here in the city of New York are low-income neighborhoods in Brooklyn and Queens and the Bronx, Northeast Bronx, South Bronx, East New York, Coney Island, parts of Far Rockaway, Flushing. Uh, and, and um, uh, in high density areas, particularly low income housing, we see the highest uh, rate of, of infection and death. Um, and uh, and uh, so indeed, um, uh, communities of color are, uh, are continue to be, have been and continue to be um, the most affected uh, by this um, by this uh, by this virus, and there is uh, uh, and 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 that's the terrible news. Um, the uh, joyful news is that uh, when I walk out on the streets, all my neighbors are wearing their masks. <laughs> uh, uh, when I walk out on the streets, there's a lot of proper socially distancing that's going on. Uh, people are taking care of each other. Um, there's a, there have been a number of uh, artist created, artist driven, artist led mutual aid funds, uh, create GoFundMe accounts uh, created to support these affected communities by people who are members of these communities themselves. So I see um, people who, I see artists, I see black and brown people, I see low income people, I see queer people who are not waiting for someone else to uh, offer them a solution. Um, they are uh, crowdfunding, um, they are um, resource gathering and um, becoming many tiny foundations, um, if, uh, foundations of one, um, 
uh, individual grant makers, um, uh, uh, co collective giving circles, community giving circles, and that is incredible. Um, now, this is something that has been going on for a while. Um, it doesn't get, it doesn't make the mainstream news. It doesn't get talked about um, in the New York Times, but it is uh, very local. It is community-based and, uh, and it impacts the people who it intends to impact. Um, the, in in, in uh, civic organizations like Jack um, that are doing, um, uh, that are doing um, food delivery service, um, the black churches here in Brooklyn are, have opened up their doors um, to provide free masks and free testing um, with, uh, in, in collaboration with Northwell Health, which is a nonprofit um, healthcare organization in, 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 in the city. Um, so though these communities are the hardest uh, impacted, there are, pe there are collectives of individuals that are coming together and, um, and uh, providing services that are essential um, and that are needed. And, and it's kind of a joy, you know, for me to also know that there are a few theaters um, that have opened up their doors to um, really uh, provide um, much needed uh, services and provisions to their local neighbors. Um, this is something that I hope, uh, this is something that has been going on for a while. And I think it, you know, will, 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 and, and now it should take center stage and, and it, I'm sure it will be a part of um, the work that continues at, at, uh, at, at um, small independent theaters. And, and I hope that this is uh, just more evidence as to why we need to, uh, we need to support um, the independent, small to mid-sized arts organizations in this city uh, that do so much of the, the emotional labor, the physical labor around holding up communities that can't afford $80 tickets to see plays, um, that maybe can't leave their homes um, to uh, participate in the types of privileged culture that we, uh, you know, are a part of. Um, and so, I, you know, I'm, I'm just saying all this to say that I'm watching, <laughs> you know, the, the, the world is watching and the community is, uh, the community of makers is watching. Um, and I really want to encourage um, anyone who has a dollar, <laughs> anyone who has um, any interest in sort of what's happening locally to, 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 to find out um, and to, you know, go to, um, to Jack's website and see what they're doing. Um, also too, uh, I've created a little um, resource guide uh, with the help of a, a friend of mine, Aditya Patana, um, that is a collection of resources uh, specifically geared towards uh, people of color, um, immigrant, new American folks, um, uh, COVID-19 resources um, that um, you can access, you can apply to. We'll put it in the, um, on the HowlRound website, we'll put it in, um, in the Siegel Center website. We'll also hopefully get it up on Jackson website and we'll send it out to some of our advocacy organizations in the field um, so that people can get some of those direct services that are intended for them um, specifically, but then also if in individuals want to donate specifically to those funds um, uh, that are being directly funneled to uh, many who identify as being a part of the affected communities um, here uh, in the United States, um, you'll have, there's an opportunity for you to do that as well. Um, to either apply as an individual who's, who needs a, a grant, who's a grant seeker, or to apply as a, a donor who would like to, to make a donation. And, you know, every little bit helps, y'all. Yeah. <laughs> every little bit helps. So. No, thank you. That's great. Um, just to touch on when you were talking about how 
these efforts were happening like it completely in the community. Some of them, you know, grew but started in the communities. Just want to bring up, so at Jack, we partnered with We Keep Us Safe Abolitionist Network. Um, please check them out on Facebook, like their page, keep following them. They're incredible. And it's the effort is run and organized uh, flawlessly by Samantha Johnson. And Samantha actually, Samantha is based out of Jack now, and it's over 120 families, uh, very locally, like in the very like walking vicinities, are are given um, different foods for those those families in need. Um, whether it's those are our, our elders in the community that just uh, cannot make it to the grocery store, or it's just too much of a risk, from families that have just really large families and they need to stay home with the kids, and uh, it's not going to the grocery store is is just not something that can happen. And so, but this all started when Samantha started doing it in her building. When she started realizing someone, one of her neighbors on the fourth floor needed some groceries and uh, didn't feel comfortable enough to get out there or didn't feel like they were healthy enough to take the risk. And then Samantha personally started working with a neighbor on the fourth floor to take care of them. The fifth floor, the first floor. And from there, it grew to a point of now having a hub at Jack that has cars and volunteers that are rotating and there are multiple times a week. But something I just think is so beautiful about We Keep Us Safe Abolitionist Network is that this effort, which they have no intention on stopping next month, the month after, things like that, eventually at Jack, we plan on figuring out how to, how to have that happening with shows like how is that going out um how is that going during the day and then productions at night but just it's so inspiring to me that for samantha it just started with her neighbor the floor below oh, and then right. it's now over 300 uh families i think it is really uh, representing a, a, a new york um, a, a spirit and uh, on the other hand um one cannot help but think it's the richest country in the world it has been completely unable to provide testing. Even months later, uh, production of masks didn't really work. Test sets were not available. The ones promoted seem to be failing. And now churches and small theaters have to take over what traditionally is done by the government that is there to protect people. Uh, Trump has been called also on this show a mass murderer, someone who says inject disinfectant in your blood. Uh, don't, he doesn't wear a mask. You ridicule the in the very beginning, the threat of it. Um, is there in the community you talk about, you know, or yours, is anger rising? Or do you say, it has always been like this, it will never change. It's just another storm. That's a really well, good question. Yeah, I think that's great. You know, I think it's important to say, I mean, like there's sort of, for me at least, there's, I, I exist across multiple communities um, and not only one and, and it's, 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 it's certainly, um, there's no monolithic um, emotion or experience of history or this historical moment. Um, in terms of rage, you know, I'm always fond of, you know, James Baldwin, who's, you know, uh, who reminds us that, or who has, you know, uh, who has said very uh, beautifully that, you know, to be a black person in this country is to be filled with rage. Uh, and that is a that is a fact and a poetry, um, and but I'm also reminded of you know this is the this week is the the birthday of Lorraine Hansberry, um, you know our great uh, one of our great playwrights, uh, and and in one of and in one of her plays a, a character says to another character, um, why don't you sit down and take a moment to reflect. And so I kind of want to have the, my full humanity in that I can be completely filled with rage and also stay quiet and use my, and use my, my tools of reflection as a, as a, a, a tool of resistance. Um, to answer your question though, about this spirit of um, frustration that, um, you know, teams from uh, injustice 
and um, lack of access to a variety of different resources, you know, healthcare, education, um, how, uh, uh, housing, fair housing. Um, you know, many artists right now, uh, our friends, our colleagues, our neighbors who are um, performers, who are directors, uh, who are designers, uh, are uh, taking part in um, a rent strike, right? Um, uh, so that uh, the, both of, for many of them who work, uh, who are kind of doubly hit by this pandemic, they, they, they don't have a, uh, access to, to doing what they're gift, sharing their gifts with us uh, through, their, through their art. And then some of them who work in the service industry or in the hospitality industry can't have those jobs either. So where is relief going to come from? Economic relief going to come from? Uh, so yeah, people are very upset because uh, this is a reality that is uh, past and present. Um, and we do, it is an election year and I hope people will use their vote uh, in this country to really um, great effect um, and not just uh, rhetorical effect, but, but true action. Um, and, you know, uh, the American president is, uh, has never uh, shown any empathy uh, for my community. Um, and so I have no other thing to say. Uh, I, I don't look to this person for, for guidance. I don't look to this person um, for, uh, uh, for the answers. I look to Lorraine Hansberry. I look to James Baldwin. I look to Jordana de la Cruz. You know, I look to um, Lynn Nottage. I look to Susan Lori Parts. You know, I look to uh, the people who have been in this field, at least, on the front lines of empathy, on the front lines of humanity, um, offering. Um, stories and uh, an opportunity for um, collective community um, that uh, allows me to both be filled with rage and reflect. <laughs> so it's uh, that I, I believe, at least it has been my experience, is a powder keg. That's combustible energy right there. Um, when you have the full spectrum of your humanity the full spectrum of your emotional uh, uh, availability uh, present. Um, and so, yeah, so, uh, and, 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 I, and, and I believe, again, that this will be an opportunity, um, not only because it's an election year and not only because um, the actions that people are taking really speak for themselves and everyone's watching what everyone else is doing. Um, I think that this is a real great opportunity um, to activate all of that energy um, around new ideas, around um, new kinds of institutions, around new forms, um, um, to hear Jordana talk about the building, the institution. Well, we're gonna do this during the day and we're gonna show plays at night. To, to know that that's an action that's going to proceed gives me such great energy. Um, similarly, um, uh, a theater, the Bushwick Star, which is a place where I've worked, um, a phenomenal space that really, um, you know, they only have six slots a year where they show plays and inevitably uh, the, the work is, the work highlights um, uh, black, brown, queer, Asian, Latinx folks, um, uh, emerging artists, um, as well as established artists. Um, they use their space for lots of different kinds of things, um, educational activities during, the, and this is a tiny space. <laughs> mm -hmm. Um, and that's what they've been doing and they don't do it as a rental, they do it as programming. So that's, uh, I see, you know, this gives me great hope 
Um, you know, it gives me goosebumps to know that there's, there's, there are institutions who have been doing this work and, and intend to continue to do it. Um, and, 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 and I'm excited to, to, um, to participate, um, but also, you know, as someone who's interested in exactly this type of advocacy to, you know, um, to celebrate it. Um, yeah, the sense of, you know, I feel like I haven't heard that word in a while to celebrate. You know, I even, I just had a, a birthday during um, COVID. Oh, happy and, birthday. <laughs> <laughs> it actually was really, really lovely, um, which was not expected. But uh, my family and dear friends, uh, they, they really brought it. So thank you all. But I, this sense of celebration, and I think for me that also, you know, it connects to experimentation. And you were talking about how we're going to make now and continue making and continue what we've what we've made before you know a question everyone's asking is like what's it going to look like in x amount of months or such and you know i think mm -hmm. we talked a little bit about that's uh not the question we're as interested in as what have you been doing always done that is going to continue and just how is it going to continue so rather than what's going to be the new thing it's more like your your collect your focus on collect collective liberation freedom how will that now find a new find new ways to experiment and come out in different forms in different places through through different mediums um and i just think you know uh i don't know it just celebration isn't something i've thought about in a while and just like hearing you say it like you're someone i i celebrate and want to celebrate and and it makes me just think of the people who have inspired me and continue to inspire me today, whether or not I was able to go to their show that was supposed to happen three weeks ago. They're just as important to, to my work and my life as, as if when, when I don't get to see them or don't get to bring in their work because it's, you know, um, I really believe in not making work for the community, but making work with the community. And we're all going to still do that together. Uh, that's that's who we are, and that's how we're made. And you know, even I'm inspired by so many things people are doing. For instance, like Target Margin, they had costume designers just design masks, and then on bikes, they the team all rode out and delivered them. And it was exciting to me to hear, oh, like that's a way to activate and work with costume designers. Like we, there's all these ways we can find to work together. Mm -hmm. And there's also, I feel like we're doing a really beautiful job in giving each other permission to not do those things as well, to not feel like you need to be making masks or on a bike or delivering food. I feel like we've been really gentle with each other. I know personally, I feel like I've been extremely gentle with um, the people I love and the community around me. I can't say I've done that for myself, to be frank. Uh, but I think it's, it's baby steps. And I don't, this is, I think, a, a much longer road than I at least initially <clears throat> imagined. So just like making our way there. I was telling them um, when I was talking to some people this morning, I was telling them the day before uh, the COVID first quarantine in March, so it was March 11th or something of like that. I had had an appointment and I actually, I don't even know if you'll see it, but um, what, wait for it. There, nope, here we go, here we go. Nope, she can't do it. Um, anyway, I got a tattoo, I'm bad at angles, that says tender on my arm. Mm. And it's a reminder for me to be tender with myself, to be kinder to myself. I think that's uh, something I, have struggled with in my life and just continue to struggle with. And I was telling someone this morning that for me, it feels like it could just say moose because it's, it's not, I'm not being able to take it in for myself, but that's, I think, part of the journey. And I hope that standing still during some of this time, I'll be able to take that tattoo in because there's a reason I got it in a place that it's hard to show you because it's very much just directed for my eyeline. And I just, I, I just want everyone to take care of themselves 
and to find those rituals of self-care like you've mentioned. And I'm inspired when you all do it. And I think I'll be, I'll be able to do it more the more you all do it and share. So mm -hmm. I appreciate you for doing those. Yeah. Yeah, so in a way, this time is an invisible tattoo, whether we see it or not, that it's going to be left on our bodies and our minds. And um, let's talk about theater and art, making art, making theater. Um, do we have to do things differently? Or do we have to do what you guys were doing better and, uh, and continue? Or is there a reinforcement? Does something has to change radically? I think it, I don't know if it has to, I think it just naturally is going to. It will change. What will change? I mean, I'd like to, I'd like to think what will change is our, how we value intimacy uh, and how we value holding space with one another. I know that, that I value that so much more than I did even two months ago. And I don't, that's something I hope we don't lose. That's something I hope that doesn't just go away after a few months, but that really, I don't know. It's, I can't remember the last time I worked on something with a fourth wall. And it's because when everyone's in the room, I feel like everyone needs to be in the room and we need to be all connected and we need to be there. And I personally am not interested um, in creating any work where that's not the case. And a big part of that is how intimate and vulnerable you are as an audience member and on someone at stage when, when you, you're forced to like be placed in a place to connect. So if you choose not to get, connect, fine, but you haven't been given that fourth wall, you haven't been given that distance. And I'd like to, I would love to see things go further that way and go even more extreme that way. Um, even as, especially if it's smaller groups for quite some time. Like I love the idea of having a show with smaller groups. Um, Mayfield Brooks did a show at Jack where a portion of it took place. They created um, their, their installation in the dressing room. And so only about six people at a time could go through the dressing room area. And they spent almost 10 minutes there before they came out to the larger open Jack space. And that 10 minutes in that dressing room, which was turned into a, a beautiful installation by Mayfield, was so moving and so powerful. And it makes me think, well, what if that becomes like the type of work that we're all doing? So, I don't know if that answers your question, but. No, 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 it's a very good question. It's a very important comment, yeah. Too. I think that intimacy is um, a beautiful way of thinking about um, the theater at all, but certainly uh, an opportunity for the, the future. Um, I had the pleasure to um, have a play made at the Brick Arts Media um, last April, which was called Self Portraits. And in part, it was a collection of um, 25 different uh, weird uh, performance works, uh, some of which were based in ritual, some of which are based in text. Um, some devised with the performers, um, and it, it and this was work I first actually started building Frank at Prelude, um, and I built in very small parts because it was uh, very much about um, intimacy. We built in small parts, and then we put the whole thing together in April of last year. And uh, we it was a it was I was the, it came from a question which is what is a play that where the audience, number of audience mimics the number of performers. And so we had 22 performers and I wanted to do the play for 22 audience so that it was a one-to-one a -one relationship, but we couldn't quite do it for 22. We settled <laughs> ultimately on like 46 or something like that, which still felt very intimate. Mm -hmm. And we moved around the building and it was this beautiful, um, collage of uh, bodies and space. Um, and uh, it really demanded uh, attention 
uh, on the part of uh, the spectator because we wanted to share something and show something. Um, but it, 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 this notion of intimacy is um, antithetical in lots of ways, I would say, in, at that scale of what you just described to larger institutional um, ways of making work. So what I'm hopeful for is that we break the mold, frankly, um, and that the mold uh, becomes uh, form, uh, uh, form fitted to the artists who are making the work. Uh, and um, by that, I don't just mean the generative artist. I don't only mean uh, the playwrights uh, or you know the people who make physical things. Um, I mean to everyone. Uh, community is in, is crucial to the work that I make, but it really begins uh, not with a text or a, a phrase or an image. It really begins with the people who you invite into the room. So that's the first community, and you get your shit together, and then you share that with an audience. Right, you the a community extends. I love what you said about the fourth wall. It, there's no such thing. There never was. There never was. And so, um, to be able to acknowledge that uh, that has been happening and that we want more of that, I'm t I'm with you. I'm totally with you. But I also just also to answer your question too is like uh, or to 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 respond, Frank, to what you were asking. You know, for me, it's not so much about, um, I don't know if it will begin from like a statement on my part uh, or on Jordana's part uh, or on, you know, the part of any of these, uh, our, our friends and colleagues who are part of these talks or part of any institution. It's really going to come from, I, I believe, questioning, right, and, and inquiry and asking ourselves lots of things maybe we haven't been asking ourselves before. So to Jordana's point about the, you know, uh, the, 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 the space at Jack as actually being a community space, right? What is the building and why is it what it is? Um, how are we taking care of each other in ways beyond um, the ways in which we've done it previously, right? Um, 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 who needs to be heard from yes. that hasn't been, right? The, uh, some of these things begin, sadly, that when we start thinking about the future, they sort of begin from a place of scarcity, right? And what is perhaps lacking in, um, in some of the work we're doing and some of the programming. And it also sometimes comes from the work of activists, artists, advocates who feel left out, who feel like they're continually on the margins, you know, railing at the, at the gates um, of the ruling class um, asking for some resource. So uh, I hope that people start asking themselves questions um, uh, about um, what will come next. But really based on the notion of abundance and that um, there's, a, there's a great deal of loss um, that we're experiencing, but uh, I believe that there is um, the spirit of abundance in much of the work that I make, in much of the work that Jordana makes, in much of the actions we see people taking, as she mentions, target margin. You know, I know I know several actors and and uh, designers who are making masks, who are doing um, food delivery, and so there is some effort. Um, taking place and 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 so yeah so I I I I do believe that um, if we ask ourselves the right kinds of questions um, and begin from that place as opposed to necessarily always having to feel you have the answer um, or you have to make a statement 
um, or as Jordana says so beautifully, you have to be doing something. Let's let's you know. Let's make sure we <clears throat> move with intention um, and with focus in the right directions. Yeah, certainly. I think, uh, as you say, we have to really ask uh, why do we do that? Uh, what is it where we are doing it in, and and uh, for whom? New York City's theater is, in a way, so dominated by commercial theater, a multi-billion-dollar industry. I might not be fully aware of it, but I do not see uh, a strong outreach beyond the community itself. Uh, of course, so many artists there, great, great, great artists are out of work, and it provides a lot of job, but it doesn't feel that is engaged in the community in the way a Jack does, a Bushwick star does, uh, what you talk about to represent the communities. Um, also, you know, we should hear the languages we hear on the streets, we should hear them on the stages, we should see them. Um, uh, it's not reflected uh, what we see on stage. Uh, we do so many international uh, artists at the Siegel Center. Nobody ever, these great writers models have ever had a chance to have their work presented uh, in, in New York. Uh, it's a very, very, very rare um, occasion. Um, uh, the Gorky Theater in Berlin, a great theater that said, let's not just talk about immigrants, refugee, first, second generation. Let's give them the theater. Let's hand them over. They do it in actually not write a play about them. And um, they came to the conclusion that every play they do is subtitled. So in, in America, I mean, every thing you see anywhere in New York City would have Spanish subtitles or, or other, you know, as a given, because why would you think you have to understand it uh, all? Um, there are, um, you know, so many things that, uh, that should change. As you said earlier, families who cannot afford whatever family from Queens or the Bronx says, we have two or three kids, let's go to see a show on Broadway. It would cost them six or eight hundred dollars if they want to go out and eat something for one evening. It's not possible. There should be access to the arts, healthcare, and education as a human, basic human rights. It's shocking to hear that churches give out tests in America. It's it's shocking, I think, and it's great that they do it, and we need it, and it should be helped. But something systematic, system, systemically is is wrong, and it and it has to be uh, addressed. Um, from, the, from your experience um, in the communities, because perhaps all theaters will look at also what do these small spaces in New York do, like Jack or Bushwick, they found something that perhaps worked and it does. What did you guys found that, that really worked, that had an impact, it made a difference, it created a new form? What, from your experience and what, what do you feel is something, you know, for our listeners, maybe in all the countries around the world, but also in the, in the US, where you feel what we do, this is something to think about. I think take the take the lead from the artists you bring in. You know, we 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 focus on bringing in artists rather than specific productions. Yes, we're having these conversations of what are you working on, or there might be something that they've sent us that we've read or we've seen a piece of. But it's really it's really the artists that we bring into the the room, and that's who we are that's who we're connected to, that's who we're committed to. And I'd say, if you take the lead from the artist, what are your artists saying? What is the pattern you're hearing? And that's the road to go down. And I think, you know, Alec Duffy was, um, is and was brilliant in that after a few years at Jack, he started seeing a shift where all the artists were, all their work was including activism. It was about being Latinx artists, black artists, queer artists, and, then from that season started to become, to become curated towards what those people were saying from their own experiences, rather than bringing in what, what we were interested in and then having the artist mold and fit themselves in that. I would just love to see more of what the artists wanna say and do, because I feel like a lot of times artists come to Jack because someone else said no, and we are saying yes. And I would love to, for more people to say yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm saying yes all day. I'm amening that, you know, um, you know, to, to, to the, uh, the, there is nothing to, to, for me, um, artists are not people who should be put into a box uh, other than a black box. <laughs> uh, and um, and given the space the, for reverie and for recreation and for 
sharing the sharing of ideas, even if those ideas make us a little uncomfortable or make certain people uncomfortable, um, let's talk about that. Let's 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 look at that um, and let's ask those questions. There are incredible models um, of uh, uh, collective leadership happening right now at places like Jack, at places like Soho Rep, uh, at places like uh, the defunct PS122, now Performance Space New York. So there are people who in the theater space who are moving towards what does it mean to have artist run spaces, collective leadership, and really focus on some of the things that Jordana mentions, which are kind of crucial, which is what do the artists want to say? What questions are they asking? And how can we help them ask those questions yes. the way in which they want them to be heard? This is crucial. This is almost, for me at least, no, there's no other pathway forward. Um, uh, if we want to achieve this kind of liberation that you described, Jordana. I also want to just say to uh, Frank, to your point, you know, I'm actually delighted that Black churches are doing testing because it shows me who's doing what. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and, and that's a historical uh, fact is that uh, Black churches in, uh, in this country have been centers for civic activity um, for community organizing, um, for care, um, when the government uh, historically refused us opportunity um, and, and access um, to resources. So I actually don't, uh, I don't look towards um, political leadership uh, exclusively um, to respond to, to the needs uh, of my body and of my community, uh, my community uh, because as we see now and as we, as we have seen for decades, um, the political establishment in this country is hostile to artists um, and disinterested in um, discomfort um, and being questioned. Um, and, uh, and we see it uh, in, in not only in um, the highest levels of all three branches of the government, um, state, local, and federal, we see it in the shadow government, which is the ruling class, which is um, you know, uh, uh, individuals of affluence who per perhaps prefer some conservative art or prefer some um, friendly art. You know, I, I, I desire, for more art of feeling. I desire for more unfriendly art. I, I desire for art that takes us out of the places we know and puts us in an, a, a, another planet, another universe. Um, and, uh, and I desire that particularly from uh, the voices of artists of color um, because uh, we are often given um, the, the rule book of how to do certain things in certain spaces. Um, and, you know, I just burn the rule book. That's just what I do is I just, I'm like, oh, I, I just won't go into that room. Um, I won't go into that building if, uh, if I get, if I need to uh, follow a certain etiquette or um, become somebody else who I'm not. Um, so, so yeah, so, so and, and, and if that doesn't happen, uh, a conditional <laughs> uh, proposition. If that doesn't happen, then I will just, we, we, I will do what I've been doing. We will do what we will, what we have been doing, which is collect among each other, which is work and challenge each other um, and advocate for um, the spaces and the, the resources to do that in greater numbers. Um, and because we have the facility and we have the capacity, we have the um, energy and, um, and this is the moment for, um, for change. So, so, so yeah, so. Yeah, yeah. It, is, it is a moment uh, for, for change. Uh, one of the playwrights we had here, I think it was Natalia from uh, Ukraine has said, we always thought uh, one day I'll do this, I read this, I think about that the moment 
in a way is now um, to think it through and perhaps change ourselves as uh, Thomas Oba and I said yesterday he feels he changes the person and as an effect his work will change. Who do you admire as artists or curators? Who do you feel are on the right path from your context where you're in? And what books are you reading? What are you, what's inspiring you guys? Well, I can start with a book. I'm always, uh, when I hear what artists I admire, I immediately, I'm like, it's for me, it's the question of just like, what music do you listen to? Because I'm like, <laughs> so many in so many different just ways. Just right now in the moment, we all have <laughs> difference, of course. Yeah, but there's yeah, something what you feel might make yeah. more meaning at the moment, yeah. Um, you know, Stephanie Yabar is always an artist that inspires me. And uh, she mm -hmm. was someone who was on the, on the um, call I was on this morning. And I mean, I can't even, I don't even have specific examples to give, but just, I think just her, how transparent she is, how transparent she is if she were to be talking to us right now, how transparent she is during an, um, an interview when expressing herself on social media, when talking to an audience, it's something that I, I just strive to be as frank, honest, and transparent as she is. And I just feel like during a time like now where it's really, it's easy to really, really hold, pull back or, or hold what you wanna say. And I find, and that's not something she does. And that's something I, I really admire. Um, I admire, Philip, for contacting me to have this conversation. I've been contacted to have a lot of conversations about how Jack is handling this crisis um, versus crisis of the past. And, you know, that comes up with Sandy, that comes up from back to 9-11 and all these things that I was not present for, um, nor was I even actively working in New York for. Uh, so it's, I only have so much I can, I can share from that, but I, feel like Philip asked me to come and talk from a personal place with you. And that to me, I have so much admiration for people who actually want to know where each of us are, uh, whether it's a, a pretty place or not, whether it's like Philip, when we first talked was like, how are you doing? And I'm just like, you know, pretty depressed, <laughs> but something like the other day was pretty great. I smiled a lot. Um, and I, I just really admire anyone who has their arms open and no judgment right now for that. And for books, Emergent Strategy by Adrian Marie Brown. It's a book I've had for a while, but it's one of those that I can keep coming back to. And I just feel like every few pages I've highlighted a quote that speaks to me. And if I even just scroll through for quotes, it just brings something new for, for me in my day. Thank you. I, um, I, I doubly endorse uh, Adrienne Marie Brown and Emergent Strategy. And also she has a fantastic book called Pleasure Activism, which I think came out last year. And if you have any doubt about um, whether or not there's joy in the revolution, read Pleasure Activism and you'll your doubts will all be uh, suppressed. Um, it's a beautiful book and a beautiful book, I think, to read uh, right now uh, about uh, Black, Brown, queer, um, uh, indigenous artists, Asian artists uh, who, are work, who are working in the arts um, around revolutionary um, uh, ideas and, and uh, performance. Some other things, I mean, I'm reading, I love what you said, uh, Jordana is like, you know, sort of like, what are you listening to? You know, I think I am listening to sounds that aren't immediate to me. So it's nice to listen to sounds of uh, the ocean. <laughs> uh, it's not, even though I know it's a coastal town we're in, we, you know, we don't think of New York as that, but um, uh, I like to uh, listen to, um, I like to listen to other ways people are organizing. So there's a great little Instagram live uh, thing called Verses, which I've, I've listened to a little bit, even though I'm not on Instagram, I look on someone else's phone and that's nice. Um, so people, how other people are sharing. I, I think that, you know, I'm, I'm reading what I'm also just 
personally reading a lot right now is poetry. Uh, poetry is really powerful. Uh, and it's uh, a time right now, especially in thinking about reflection, thinking about um, the ways in which we're disconnected or fragmented. Um, uh, I think poetry is beautiful. And so- What poets do you read? So I, I'm reading June Jordan, um, the great um, June Jordan, uh, who okay. is a former, former resident of Bedford-Stuyvesant and also a Bay Area professor um, uh, who passed away of cancer in, the, in, in, in uh, I believe it was 2007. Uh, she yeah. always gives me strength, a great book People's of People's Poetry, right? People's Poetry, a great book of mm -hmm. hers called Some of Us Did Not Die, which is a collection of essays and poems reminding me that I'm alive. Um, and uh, the poetry of Tracy K. Smith, uh, our great uh, uh, black woman uh, poet laureate of this country, um, who is just a phenomenal writer. Uh, Jericho Brown's beautiful book, The Tradition. Um, uh, uh, the work of Mahmoud Darwish, the great Palestinian poet. Um, uh, and then a lot of poetry uh, about nature, um, which is reminding me to that I'm a part of the natural world. Um, and, um, and that, uh, and that, uh, and that I shouldn't, that I need to remember to breathe um, and to be inside my body. Um, Cause my body is, uh, is also a poem. Um, so, so yeah, so I recommend, uh, Sarah Rule just put out a beautiful book of poetry called 44 Poems for You. Um, there's a lot of great poetry in the world right now um, that I think can, uh, that can sustain us through these times. Neruda has an incredible book of bilingual poetry called uh, Extrava Extravagaria. Uh, which is wonderful, Octavio Paz. There's just so much. <laughs> no, it's sort um, of the time where we also, in a way, perhaps listen more careful. It reaches us. We're more vulnerable, you know, as, as uh, Jordana said. We're coming closer um, to an end. Um, I know, uh, Philip, you also teach at, at TDM in Harvard as one of the experiments. Also, David Levine is there, you know, where they're really are trying a new approach, an experimental approach and away perhaps from a bit more commercial um, um, education of Mangas or cook, which perhaps is closer than the ART world and um, closer perhaps what color arts does or the director's program at Carnegie Mellon. So you are um, involved also in, in shaping a generation in Jordana to your work too. What do you tell um, artists who are starting out, uh, uh, and do they call you now up in these times of Quran? If so, if they, what, do you, what do you tell them? What is significant to focus about? What is meaningful and what is lasting? You know, I, may I, Jordana? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. You know, I don't really tell them a lot, Frank. I actually ask them, um, what are they interested in? And what keeps, what do they care about? What keeps them up at night, you know? Um, what, what kind of world do they wanna see? Um, and how are they going to get there? So that's what I, uh, that's sort of what I teach. <laughs> um, and then we shape that into some kind of form that can be shared with an audience. Um, whether that's an audience of one or an audience of 1,000, whether that's an audience on social media or that's an audience in person, um, whether that's th through the sense of the ear and its auditory or it's through the sense of, of, of the eyes and its visual or through the nose and it's something fragrant. Um, so that's what I, I do is, I, is, is um, I ask a lot of questions and encourage them to ask questions and to formulate um, the answer that, that, that is indigenous and native to their own experience and their own body and space. Um, I, do, I do a lot less 
um, uh, telling and tes testifying um, uh, in part because this is just my own practice is challenging myself through inquiry and trying to find um, a way forward um, that, um, that maybe I can't, that is a little opaque right now, you know? Um, so that's sort of, you know, but it's a great privilege to be able to engage um, people interested in the arts and interested in, in, in the interdisciplinary, very specifically, the intersectional. Um, that's a great privilege and I take it very seriously. Um, and I see it as an honor, frankly, um, to be able to center um, the voices of um, the people who, um, who I share with them, many of whom are the folks I just mentioned, um, poets, uh, writers, artists of color, um, uh, and, 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 and the institutions such as Jack, uh, where their work uh, will likely be seen, you know, uh, and celebrated and uplifted um, and made affordable. Mm -hmm. um, so, so, so that's much of what I do. Um, and yeah, I hope to keep doing it, but yeah. yeah. And I just like to add um, just a, a small note that I feel like I'm more having conversations about dreaming uh, in terms of if you don't feel like you can do anything now, which I completely, like if you feel like that, then I support you. I breathe with you on that. But what do you wanna dream about? Like you said, Philip, what, um, what do they like want to do or what, what, what is important to them at night? What do they think about? And I think it's a great time to be dreaming and there's almost this, to me, there's the, the looming part of, okay, you've been dreaming, but what are you gonna do with it? That, that's not there right now, because for the most part, you can't do anything with it right now. And so I feel like there's almost like more freedom to like explore and express, because it doesn't feel like once you put a dream out there, someone's gonna ask you what the product of it is. And so I just, I think it's a really great, great time to dream that's what I've been doing and encouraging any students who have reached out to me to do. Um, that being said, I know it's really hard. I know when I graduated, I immediately, I had already been working um, in a theater and I just went from there and kind of never stopped. And so it's, it is hard for me to have a, you know, students be like, okay, I just graduated. I thought I'd have a job. I was offered a job. All these things are like now no longer happening. What do I do? Uh, and it's a hard, it's a hard, it's a hard answer for me to give them, but I just feel like if I couldn't do anything right now at that point, I would just really, really lean on dreaming and journaling and seeing what comes from that. Uh, and just to rewind, because I realized how could this not come up? So this is The Utterances and it's by Carlos Serra and it is incredible and everyone should get a copy. It just came out and Carlos Serra is an amazing playwright, poet, writer, activist um, throughout the South and in New York and in LA, uh, screenwriter and truly one of the most incredible people I have ever met and am honored to be in his life. And so really the utterances, you will, you will thank me. Jordana, you have just given me my whole life. I am like gonna weep. Carlos is a genius. He is a brilliant artist and a wonderful person. And the American theater is sleeping on him. Yes, wait. The up. American theater is sleeping on Carlos. Do his work right now, folks. Um, to your point about. Um, college or about people who want to engage in this field right now, which by the way, you know, this is a, I consider this a form of engagement um, and co community organizing. Uh, it's going to be crucial. It's going to be more, more crucial than it already has been 
for us to make space that is safe and that is flexible for people who are interested in participating in this community, in, uh, in, in the theater and in performance. If walls continue to be erected, fake walls, as you said, Jordana, fourth walls, if walls continue to be erected um, that keep uh, ideas, uh, strange ideas, weird ideas, um, uh, um, naivete, um, curiosity, um, formal invention, um, empathy, uh, reverie, uh, a sense of play and a sense of uh, foolishness um, and fun. Uh, if, if walls continue to be uh, erected against some of those feelings uh, and some of those, uh, some of those uh, uh, works of art, we will, um, we will not be going uh, in the direction uh, that we could be. Um, so I, 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 can't, I can't stress it enough. Um, how can we open the gates in this moment uh, and really let, uh, let the artists kind of, you know, run amok? <laughs> um, and, yeah. and, 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 and that is certainly um, uh, an opportunity that any of these institutions, any of these buildings, any of uh, these, uh, uh, any of uh, people who have individuals who have space or institutions that have space uh, can do, how can we rub up against uh, the people right next door to us um, in more meaningful um, ways? Um, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm I'm here for it, you know. <laughs> it's, it's quite so open. Uh, open up uh, uh, the, the the rooms, the buildings. Uh, listen carefully, reading poetry, uh, dreaming, and uh, and to uh, to take action and to be part of a community to engage. Uh, and this is um, of significance. And I really would like to thank both of you uh, for for staying. We went a bit over time, a little bit much over time, but I felt this was a really um, important talk and this is a place where we really do listen as you say you listen to the artists who come to your space at Jack or you fill up to the artists who come to you so we all have to do that and um, and uh, and find what is inside a young famously said about dreaming everything we normally see in the world has already happened Pe someone designed the buildings the street everything even if you look at something it takes a while for the mind to process in your dreams you are the architect, the screenwriter, the stage designer, a costume designer, you write the diary, and this is you, is your closest who you are, and you should listen to it. And as he said, if you find the right way to listen to what you might save your life or it might save, in a way, this country that in a way is built also on dreams, and we should have the right dreams, dreams that are useful, they work, they are meaningful, and not the wrong ones. They are no longer the right forms. So you both do such a great uh, contribution. Thank you all. And thanks for our listeners to stick with us. If you stick with us for the time, we know we went a bit over time, but it was important to hear from Jordana and Philippe. And uh, if you uh, still want to keep on listening to us, uh, and it's important, we need great audiences. We need great theater, but we need for you to listen and also for them, the artists to have the feedback and also it's about you in a way you are the artist you create your life you create your days you create your uh, engagement your action so it's all also about you what they say about the artist means also our our listeners in the sense of a voice of a everybody in that way is an artist so if you want to hear more next week we also have i think a very very significant program um, with artists who engage for over decades in their life in theater and performance and uh, help us to get meaning in this world we live in. There's the great Christopher Donk uh, from Belgium, a very significant uh, contemporary theater artist, not as much known also as he should be. He is very well known in Europe and around the world. Um, uh, performance research has put out a book uh, uh, about him, uh, Peter Eckersall, my colleague, put it together. He will be with us and he has uh, significant things to say. Um, his work is objects, robots, um, space, closed spaces, and his deep concern for environment and also indigenous communities 
uh, will be something we will hear from. Uh, we have uh, Aina Tour from Spain, Barcelona. She runs the Sala Beckett, which is an innovative space over decades. Uh, it's uh, uh, where new talents are forged, come out, uh, and uh, where new work uh, shows up first, the great Anne Bogart will be with us. Anne Bogart, who has also, as a pioneer, uh, engaged in working for theater and performance in America uh, as an artist. She's also a great teacher, and her work always uh, has been defined as an engagement, as a social engagement, a socially engaged art form. Uh, Patricia Cornelius is a playwright from Australia, uh, the 60s, 70s generation, which very much engaged with communities, uh, with uh, the uh, uh, people who are the disadvantaged at the margins of society. And so we will hear uh, what is happening in Australia. And then uh, again, we will hear from uh, Hong Kong, Hoi Fai Vu will uh, talk to us. Uh, we had a Hong Kong artist already with us, and they say a bit what you guys said, um, using this is the crisis, uh, the crisis for us also will start once this is over. We just heard yesterday, uh, China imposed new restrictions, new laws that are unacceptable for democratic uh, uh, structure, a structure that was promised to hold for 50 years. And um, it came a shock to everybody there uh, yesterday. And uh, and um, so we will hear an update from our colleagues in Hong Kong and uh, see what's on their mind. Um, so again, thank both of you uh, for being with us. Thanks for HowlRound for sticking with us, Thea and Travis, and of course the great VJ, uh, Andy and Sun Yang from the Siegel team. And really to our listeners, thank you for taking um, the time to, to be with us and also listen to voices of artists. They are on the right side of social justice, of social progress. They have been on the right side of history always. It's very, very, very few exceptions. So if we would all listen more to them, the world would be a much better place. And I think as Jordana said, we listen to the artists who come in to our place and we build the work from there. It's a radically different approach. If you think about commercial theater, production theater, production based, the karaoke system that exists in so many parts of the world that you're re-sing songs most of the time, not as good as the original, sometimes better, yes. But this is a new way of making theater. New forms have emerged in this post-traumatic world. We, we do live in ensemble work. And uh, this is a great example from New York. So thank you for joining. And um, I hope to hear from you next week. Uh, our audiences and also with questions and uh, with an engagement that um, that brings uh, us forward and the search for for new forms and see what's already out there as Philip and Jordana said there are great masters out there we just don't know about them so thank you and uh, have a great weekend bye bye